principles of why the Bible is against alcohol as a beverage for a Christian. All right, and I will not rehash all of those principles tonight, though I'll recap just a couple of them. The Bible principle is the Bible, God, teaches the Christian to avoid alcohol as a drink. Scripture clearly teaches that wine, against wine, that can cause intoxication. All right, I don't think you can read your Bible with any amount of honesty and sincerity and not see at least that the Bible teaches to, that wine that causes intoxication ought to be avoided. All right, now, we're going to deal tonight with some problem passages. Some of these I have never, I shouldn't say never, never is too strong a word. Some of these are typically avoided. All right, they are argued for alcohol, but the people who are arguing against it do not even address these passages. To be honest and to be fair, I want to address them. I believe that the Bible is meant to be understood. And when the, Paul commands uh, us to study to show ourselves approved unto God, it's a command for us as well, that we ought to apply that. And if something takes a little more study, understanding, and a little deeper look into the God's Word, that's okay. Sometimes, like we talked about, um, there is low-hanging fruit in the Bible. Low-hanging milk of the word they may grow thereby but there are some things that take a little more study i believe that this particular topic alcohol in the christian is one such topic as we've seen in week after week of study tonight i want to deal with some of the problem passages as we use attempt to use the whole counsel of scripture now one verse is good enough to live by I'm going to say that one more time. One verse is good enough to live by. But what you'll find in God's Word when the Scripture says that no Scripture is of any private interpretation. It does not refer to my private interpretation and your private interpretation, and we each have our own private interpretations. Oh, it's so cute. What it refers to is that no Scripture will ultimately stand all by itself. It'll stand in the greater Scripture. What's amazing is that the, the Bible, written by different authors in three different languages on different continents, marvelously and supernaturally agrees with itself. The authority and the faith we can have in God's Word. The Bible gives commands to avoid wine. We looked at that two weeks ago. If you don't believe me, listen to it again last, two weeks ago. Examples to warn us. is the definition of glory. We are called to praise Him and glorify Him, but He needs no greater glory. He is glory. All right? And just because I choose to praise Him does not now make Him more glorious. He already is glorious. All right? He just designed it this way because that's what He did. And he can do anything he wants to do because he is God. He's not was God or will be. He is right now. So we're going to look at the whole thing, and we can choose to follow either path. You can step out of these particular sessions and these studies and say, you know what, Pastor? I hear what you're saying, but I reject 
what you're saying. That's fine. I'm trying to give you truths from God's Word and interpretations from the Word of God, not just my own thoughts and own ideas. Though, after I studied it, I came away with a conclusion. And I am pointing you toward that conclusion. All right, I make no bones about that. I'm not going to pretend for a moment that, oh, whatever you choose is going to be fine. I don't think so. All right, I believe the Bible teaches us clearly. So as we look at some problem areas tonight, we're going to look in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 3, and we'll start there, and I don't know how many we'll get through tonight. Let's pray, and that's what's blessing on the service tonight. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for this time. And Lord, I thank you for your word, which is powerful. Lord, your word, which is truth. And we'll... in 1 Timothy 3, look at 1 Timothy 5, verse 23, where Paul writes to Timothy, drink no longer water, but use a little, help me, wine, for thy stomach's sake and thine off infirmities. If you've talked to any Christian, or even some non-Christians who know God's word, and they're arguing for uh, before taking of alcoholic beverage, they know this particular verse. And they'll say, aha, look, Paul told Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake, thereby opening the door for moderation, thereby allowing us the classic loophole whereby now we get to drink alcohol. You see, it's right there in plain English, drink a little wine. How many have ever had someone use this first to them? Anybody? Am I the only one? That's all right, okay. All right, I will not ask how many have used this first, all right? I'm not asking that question. All right, the altar will be open after the church service, and for the right indulgence amount, I forgive you from your sins. No, no, I, I'm just kidding. They'll use this verse. What does Paul mean when he tells Timothy, use a little wine? Now, before we begin to address some of these things, and I think this particular passage... Feisty, right? And we're in our home, we're pretty loose in the home. We, we you know, we'll joke back and forth, and, and my kids take after my wife, and they're sarcastic, and I try to help them with it, but, you know, Doreen really gets that sarcasm going in the home. And uh, sometimes they want to verbally spar with their father. That's me. They find out very quick that I am not that smart, but I am smarter than a fifth grader. And they find out, okay, dad knows, knows what he's talking about. All right? How would you argue with Jesus Christ? All right, how would you? But we have to have a couple of foundational thoughts about this, or we'll call them presuppositions. Some of you seniors will know this word. We all operate on ideas where we presuppose things. Let me help you here. For instance, you presuppose that when you get up tomorrow morning, gravity will still be in effect. When you get out of bed, you, you presuppose that your feet will go down and you'll stand up on the ground, not hit the ceiling. Now, why do you presuppose that? I mean, have you ever, okay, hold on my bed, okay. Okay, gravity's still working. Woo, that was a close one. We'll wait till tomorrow. No, you don't even think about it. Boom, boom, thud, 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 thud.
suppose them to happen because of what we know about God. So as we address problems in Scripture, quote-unquote problems, I want to give us some structure for handling these things. This is beyond alcohol. This is for life as you read God's Word. Number one, notice this, or understand this. In Scripture, we approach Scripture with this thought that all Scripture is given by God. We get that from, from the Bible itself. And a, a doubter would say, well, that, that's circular reasoning. You trust the Bible because you trust the Bible. I trust the Bible because I believe it to be from God Almighty. Everybody trusts somebody. For some, it's themselves. I'm the highest authority in my life. If I can see it, touch it, prove it, then it is true. If I can't do that, it is not true. We have an example in the Bible, Doubting Thomas. Unless I touch it, I won't believe that it's Jesus. Truth is only what I know it to be, and Jesus shows back up. Right? Thomas, come here, son. Come here. No, Lord, you're right. You're right. And there are those who truth is relative to them. If I can see it, writing instructions for our bosses and bosses thou wilt give me 14 weeks of paid vacation every 15 weeks <laughs> if it were just our opinions we would have some different things but it's not man's opinion it is God breathed words we want to approach scripture understanding and believing it's inspiration of God so that when we see a quote problem area we know God to be true, right, and he is truth itself. I am the way, the truth. So any apparent problem is only an apparent problem which will be revealed upon further study or further knowledge. Second thought is this. When we come to a problem area, quote problem, all right, we have to work from the clear to the unclear. When we approach Scripture, we want to work from clear, what we know to be true, to things that we're not quite sure about yet. There are some passages of Scripture that don't appear to be clear at first. For instance, let me give you an example about this. You may have been asked this question. How can your God be a God of love because here, in this passage, he pronounced judgment on these people. So how can your God be a God of intoxicate second thing that is clear scripture teaches us to avoid being under the influence clear scripture teaches us that wine is deceptive that's clear scripture teaches us that there are negative consequences from alcoholic intoxicating wine that's clear scripture teaches us that wine is addictive it's clear Scripture teaches us that. And Scripture, it's clear, uses words translated for wine to refer to fermented and unfermented beverages. Those are six statements that are clear about wine in Scripture. So
So we start with that premise. Now remember this, that part of the understanding of this is that that word wine in Scripture can mean And we can easily see from that passage what the writer in Proverbs is trying to teach us. He's trying to teach us, first of all, in the first verse, verse 4, that we don't answer someone like unto them in the same manner. We know that a soft answer turneth away wrath. So when someone's yelling, the answer is not just to yell back at them. That's what he's telling us. But in the next verse, he's saying, listen, sometimes you've got to answer someone so they're not wise, so they're not staying on the path in their own conceit. Wait a second. That's not right. God is love. There are times to give an answer to every man. And so the apparent contradiction is only a lack of study, not because the Bible contradicts itself. That makes sense to you? So now we come to these problem passages. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll look here. And in verses 1 through 3, we have some instructions and requirements for a pastor, for a bishop. This is a true saying, verse 1. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Verse 2, a bishop a pastor. Then must be blameless the husband of one wife. All of these, I should pause real quick, all of these people will, will debate upon in their own time what doesn't quite fit their, their ideas. All right? But we'll take Scripture at face value. Can we a little wine for the stomach's sake. Say, oh boy, we've got to scratch our heads. All right, in chapter 3, Paul says, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, listen, the qualifications of Timothy, if, uh, you're, you're a pastor here, but you, you, they, can't, they can't be given to wine. All right, you can't partake in wine. You can't be a part of wine. You're not given to it. Not, it doesn't mean addicted to it. It means stay away from it. Okay? But then two chapters later in 20 verses, two chapters, 20 verses later in 1 Timothy 5, 23, he says, drink a little bit. So did, did Paul forget what he just said two chapters previously? Remember, this was a letter. So call it four paragraphs later. All right, I've written papers. You've written, you've written letters before. You're writing letters and, oh, you know what? Don't do this. Do this. Is that what happened? Did Paul lose his mind? Is Paul bipolar? Is Paul schizophrenic? He, he, two personalities? Is he all over the place? Or is there another explanation? We'll dig a little deeper in the passage. Because it's beyond that. Look in verse number 8. Likewise, so in the same sense of the bishops, must the deacons... All right, so he just said, in comparison to the bishops, the elders, those, those instructions I just gave you, let me now... Say, well, whoa, well, okay, Pastor. What's going on here? Let's work through a couple of things here. It's fairly, fairly clear, very clear, that for a pastor, again, that verse number three lines right up to the rest of Scripture that we've seen that's clear. When you come to the elders, or to the deacons, I'm sorry, a couple ideas, a couple thoughts. First thought is, boy, there's a loophole. Now, 
because of what I believe Scripture teaches, think, you know what? That doesn't line up with what I know of Scripture. Why would Scripture warn against it, teach against it, show against it, and then for deacons, an officer of the church, now make allowance for it? That doesn't, I don't know about you, it doesn't make sense to me at first glance, right? Like, that's a head-scratcher. So is there another explanation where there's an apparent contradiction? The answer is, yes, there is. Let me give you a couple thoughts. First of all, when Paul says much wine, the word he uses there, the word he uses um, is also used previously in the book. Previously in the book, in chapter 1, verse 4, he says it this way, neither give heed to fables. It's that same word, don't give heed to it. At that point, he's not saying don't give some heed to fables or not much heed to fables. I cannot find, I cannot find a way that that is reconciled with Scripture. Let's slide back to what Paul says to Timothy, though. Where he says, Timothy, drink a little wine for the stomach's sake. You say, well, there it is, Pastor. Forget what you said before. It's right there. I don't believe so. I don't believe so at all. Remember, wine in the Bible can mean a whole plethora of things, a whole group of things. What would make sense is that Timothy has been trying to be all things to all men. In the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, priests could not approach the temple for any amount of worship having touched anything from the vine. Period. Because Timothy worked among Jews, it would be possible, it would be feasible that Timothy had abstained from everything, almost like a Nazarite vow. Paul says, listen, you maybe have drawn this standard a little too tight. Not arguing for fermented beverage, but to say, Timothy, you won't even drink grape juice. Listen, drink a little bit of grape juice for your stomach's sake. People will say, well, pastor, there's a lot of health to be had by drinking wine. I looked that up. What I found on ungodly, non-Christian scientific websites, that if you want the benefits from wine, there is the same, exact same benefit from grape juice and even greater benefit, quote, from raw grapes when you eat the skin. So don't talk to me about health issues until you start eating raw grapes. You see, I don't believe that Paul, in the book of Timothy and Titus, was arguing for moderation. I think Paul was being consistent with all of Scripture. Avoid this thing. Avoid it. It's the only, it's the only explanation that I see that is cohesive with Scripture. And I don't believe that Paul was telling Timothy, hey, drink away, buddy, as long as you need a little bit of something for your health. I think he was saying, Timothy, you drew this really strict line. Now, you can't have this. I just told you that two chapters earlier. But you're not doing well. You're sick. So get a little bit of grape juice, and you'll be okay. I find that consistent with Scripture, and the Scripture is not contradicting itself, contradicting itself. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. But help us as we look at that to look to you for truth and wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.